Hi, dreamers. Thank you for learning with us today on Dream Speak. I'm Rika. And I'm Thomas. And this is the podcast about dreams that teaches you a complete system to help you listen to your dreams and get the guidance they're providing you every day. I'm very excited that Rika and I get to feature Joshua Hodnett. Joshua Hodnett is a longtime personal trainer and also a longtime meditator. And that's been a very significant point of connection for all of us over the years. So I'm sure it's something we will address. Josh is also a practitioner of facilitated sessions with plant medicine. And we are very honored to have you on today. Welcome, Joshua Hodnett. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Rika. Well, thanks a lot for taking the time to be with us. Um, I know that you brought a really interesting dream to share, and we'll get to that later in the episode, but we'd love to hear a little bit about the way that meditation has played a big part in your life and any other associated spiritual practices that have been a part of your world over all these years. Okay. Where my mind takes me in the beginning is my introduction to meditation, and I took a course that probably it's better known um, in the landmark or what was the S trainings. And the version that I took was the life spring model. And they basically they're all just human potential trainings. And in that course, I had a mentor that saw kind of how wound up I was. And she suggested, you know, have you ever tried meditation? I said, no. And what came to mind when she talks about meditation was Mr. Miyagi making all kinds of grunting sounds in the karate kids. So that doesn't interest me. And she says, well, <laughs> well, well try, try this out. She says, uh, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine a cloud and I want you to notice whatever thoughts come up in your mind. I want you to imagine putting those thoughts in the cloud and then blowing that cloud away. Just release it, let it go. And then when the next thought comes up, put it in the cloud and let it go. And that was my introduction to meditation. And I found that that suggestion more powerful than I ever comprehended it could be. And from that suggestion, I began to look into podcasts and I found this podcast at the time it was called Zencast. And it was a collection of Dharma talks and guided meditations. And a lot of them were from a teacher named Gil Fronsdahl that is a insight meditation teacher. And he, after listening to this and kind of diving into the world of meditation and Dharma talks, uh, they said, you know, if you really want your meditation to deepen, you need to find a Sangha, you need to find a group. And so I found a group. Um, and I began setting with them maybe once a month. It was a group that was based in Dallas called Awakening Heart, and it was a group that was founded by a monk that had gone through the lineage of Thich Nhat Hanh, and I found tremendous benefit in it, and so I began attending that on a regular basis, and then not too long after that, I ended up going to my first of the Pasana retreat, the 10-day silent, or the silent retreats. And all this was happening about the time that I was going through a very difficult divorce, challenging financial stuff from the 2008 real estate crisis, I guess for lack of a better word. That was my career. And I was watching everything that I'd worked for for many years fall apart along with my marriage. And so meditation was a tool to help me navigate a really challenging time. And at the time that I was divorced, I began looking for a roommate that would understand, at least respect the environment of meditation and the environment of mindfulness that I was trying to cultivate in my home. So when I put an ad out there, um, I believe it was on Craigslist, I mentioned meditator and it's important to me to be able to have this sacred space in my home. And Thomas responded to that ad. Thomas, you want to respond with kind of how, how that fell into your lap and how you responded to it? Essentially, I just typed meditation into Craigslist. <laughs> and because Dallas is Dallas, you were the only listing. Just one. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. It was really pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. Let me add that that is where I met you, Josh, was at the group at, yeah. at Unity, right? That's where yep. we met. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you two became acquainted for a period of years before the three of us all knew each other, right? Yeah. I think it was three years that we had been doing that together when you moved in with Josh and then I met you. Significant. Yes, <laughs> of that synchronicity. Yeah, me too. And so the reason that we're starting out talking about meditation, I think it's greatly aided to understand this if you listen to our episode with our friend Eris Klein, because something that's amazing about dream work is that it helps you get in touch with the truth that our consciousness is a spectrum and our conscious experience 
has tremendous variety. And for a lot of us, the deepest states of consciousness that we will experience on a regular basis only happen when we're sleeping, which is so strange when you first start dealing with dreams, because a lot of people's response to that will be, well, I don't remember my dreams, or I don't remember anything from being asleep. And one of the ways that I've come to contextualize that over all these years of dream practice is that the states of consciousness are so high that their consciousness really can't absorb that. They're going into very deep places within themselves and there's really no context that they have to bring back those memories when they awaken. But when you meditate and you have a stable or strong meditation practice, even if you only go through a phase where your meditation practice goes really deep for a while, you're accessing some of those same states of non-ordinary consciousness that relate to your dreams. And it's all really one fascinating spectrum. And so it was pretty neat to see Eris dwell on that because that's kind of been the centerpiece of her life is the study of consciousness and the direct experience of different levels of consciousness. So anyway, really fun issue, really complex issue, but meditation and dream work are linked. And I think we're going to probably, as we move through this conversation, we're going to be able to see that linkage a little more clearly when you eventually share your dream. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what comes to mind now is that part of my path is I attended something called the school metaphysics. And in that, one of the practices was being intentional about the dreams. And so that was kind of introductory experience to me about doing dream work, but it's just not, it's not one of the modalities that stuck with me as like a core practice, but um, I found it interesting. And especially with this dream that you were working on here, I mean, that was a huge, we'll, we'll get into it. But that was a huge insight and a huge breakthrough for me, a very unexpected, in fact. But um, in terms of meditation, I just really appreciated the evening practice that we had together for so long. I mean, we used to do this thing called the meditation hotline. And, you know, we just basically had a group phone conversation, uh, a group chat on the phone, and we would consistently show up at nine o'clock and do a 20 minute sit. And I remember we did that every day for over a year. And I really think that was beneficial to me. And I'm sure you would agree with that as well. Now, I agree. And when I tell people that we did that, they don't understand that at all. Like, <laughs> what? you just sat on the phone in silence together and then you hung up. No, there was a bell. We had a bell. <laughs> <laughs> people just didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. You know, they don't need to get it, but that's a great bridge, Josh, because I wanted to ask you over all these years, what's kept you coming back to meditation? What do you think are some of the lower level benefits that you might have gotten in touch with right away and some of the longer lasting life changes that have happened because of having a deep, relationship with mindfulness? So I, I like that question. What were the initial ones? And I think that at the time, the initial benefits was a sense of, and I'm going to go back to 2006. I think the initial benefit was just a sense of a calming of the nervous system. I'm kind of a type A personality in terms of, you know, my, I'm an Aries in the astrological world and I'm not big into astrology, but I really got that the way that I moved through the world mostly was butting my head into situations and just forcing my way through relationships. And some of the things that I learned when I was going through this life spring training was that I didn't really realize the damage or the wake of casualties that I caused and the emotional disturbances that I created in my friends and close relationships whenever I pushed to get what I wanted. I didn't realize I was doing damage and basically stepping on them to get what I wanted. It wasn't intentional, but I began to realize that I was causing harm to the people that I love by not being aware enough of their emotions and their sensitivities. And I think that what meditation began to give me was a calming of the nervous system and access to a greater degree of compassion to begin to sense when I would step on people and not mean to. I think that was the beginning of it. And it also, I think in my first few years of meditation, I remember before I had like a, a breath awareness practice or a body sensation practice, I feel like I would close my eyes and I would just travel the cosmos. I mean, just in my mind, in my awareness, I would just kind of go all over the universe, you know, kind of in my mind. And it took me a while to recognize, okay, the point of the meditation to really get benefit for it is really not to travel, not let your mind wander or your awareness wander. It's actually to anchor it. And that's what I began to do through the Vipassana practice, anchoring to my breath or anchoring to body sensations. Um, a, it's a foundational practice for me. And right now, my practice is my minimums are 30 minutes a day, six days a week. And every Sunday I do a, an hour practice and it allows me to be more receptive. It allows me to be less reactive. It allows me to be more, more patient, more compassionate. And it's just as simple as 
I'm just a better human being when I do it. Um, I'm more tolerant, and less irritable. And when I don't do it, I feel my irritation and my impatience and my uh, connection to something greater than me, it gets, it gets muddied. And I think that's why I keep doing it is because I feel a direct benefit in my inner landscape and my temperament. That's the best way that I can describe that. And I think it probably also helps you be a better facilitator for all the people that you work with. Absolutely. Yeah, no question. And one of the things that's really special about your client work as a personal trainer is that you believe that there are essentially four pillars to self-improvement on that level. Isn't that right? It, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Right? And you see what the four pillars are? Yeah. Activity, nutrition, mindset, and sleep. Those are the four pillars. What's, what's interesting is I listened to a, a podcast just recently about Plato and Socrates. And if you go back to their work, they're basically working with those same principles as fundamental. It's interesting to hear that the ancient Stoic philosophers were highly invested in these practices too. Like there's something to them, you know, and, and to me, when we invest in our movement, movement is medicine. Movement helps us in so many ways. You know, good food, but food is medicine. The Hippocrates says, let thy medicine be thy food and food thy medicine. When we talk about sleep, if we don't sleep, we're just burnt out and we've got to have that recovery time. And then the mindfulness component in the way I look at it is that uh, if we're overstimulated, and I think that's one of the biggest issues of our society right now is overstimulation from all of our inputs is that we need time to not have that stimulation. And I think that when we're not stimulated, we can kind of connect to our source. You know, and oftentimes I have this, this sense that when I'm in stillness, that I'm connected to this divine mind, something that's much, much greater than me, that is feeding me inspiration, that is feeding me motivation, that is giving me inner guidance. Even if I can't articulate it in words, I could feel it. So that's another reason that I do this practice on a regular basis. Nice. We use a model of mind in interpreting dreams where we divide the mind into three parts. We call it tri-mind. We've got our conscious mind, which is kind of how we experience the world when we're awake. But surprisingly, what we've found is that it's the smallest part or the least powerful part of our mind. Sure. And then we've got our subconscious mind, which is where I think you might start having subjective experiences of what you're talking about in a state of mindfulness, that sense of connection. But you really can't interpret dreams in the way that we do um, without the concept of superconscious mind, which is by far the most powerful and also the deepest. So it's kind of a strange word because super obviously means above, but what we mean is below the subconscious, there is this almost all powerful place where we connect to source. Absolutely. And yeah. You can feel it, you know, the, as your mindfulness practice evolves or as it lasts over years, or as you have personal awakenings, you can be in touch with that place. And I just wanted to share that that connects directly to the way that symbolic people show up in our dreams. If they are opposite gender to us, they're talking to us about parts of our subconscious, which goes a bit deeper. And then in the case of authority figures, and we are going to get into a dream that you're going to share that includes a police officer. Uh, was it a couple of police officers? Yeah. Remember. Yeah. There's three kind of bumbling, lazy police officers that came in the dream. <laughs> And so that is part of a super conscious connection that we have to source. It's not actually the source. It's our way of perceiving how's that connection going. So I think before we get into the dream, one last topic that'd be wonderful to talk about is I think you've shared enough that our listeners have a pretty good understanding of your spiritual practice and your motivations for sticking with it. But you've in recent years really become fascinated with plant medicine and you are now a trained facilitator for plant medicine sessions as well. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how you first connected with that and how you think it relates to the same non-ordinary states of consciousness or a sense of connection to source that you've been seeking through meditation. Yeah. You know, and the, the place I would begin, and this is kind of a realization that's been unfolding for me for the last three years, is I was using um, psilocybin recreationally back in 2003. Uh, I didn't have a spiritual life to speak of. There was a large dose psilocybin experience that was very transformative for me. And it was one that was with my ex-wife. And in that experience, I got just a crystal clear sense of the delineation between the physical meat suit, these physical bodies, flesh and blood, and the distinction between the energy or light body that is, we call it housed within the meat suit. And it was a remarkable realization. It was mind boggling. It was crystal clear. It was just, wow, we are not this meat suit. 
where the energy animating the meat suit and that energy is infinite that energy is immortal and that energy is timeless and it was a powerful experience and before this experience i really had a disdain for the word god and when anybody would mention the word god i would instantly ascribe kind of like yeah you're a you know, brainwashed idiot and after this experience, I lost that resistance, that ickiness around the word God. I was like, whoa, there is something here. And what's funny is that after that 2003 experience, I really didn't touch plant medicine again. I was directed towards meditation as a practice. And I went down that road for just right under 20 years of meditative practice. And I got a premonition. Uh, I was watching a, a documentary called Fantastic Fungi. And while I was wrapping Christmas presents in December, watching Fa Fantastic Fungi, and I just got this inner message really crystal clear. It says, Josh, you know, the power of these medicines, these medicines transform the way you perceive reality uh, and you need to pick them up and you need to start playing with them again. And you start learning from them again. And at the time, I'd been dealing with an injury, and I won't go into the super detail, but I had been dealing with this at this point for about a year and a half, and I had seen three specialists, and I wasn't really getting anywhere. I was following their protocols, and I was not healing, and I was looking for a way to heal. And when I saw Fantastic Fungi, I also got a sense that, I didn't know how, but I had a sense that going to these medicines and picking up psilocybin would help me to heal this horrible condition that I was dealing with. I mean, it was just agonizing. And that journey of picking up the medicine was a part of a healing journey that I realized that what I needed to do at the time is I needed to soften. I needed to soften my approach to parenting. I needed to soften my approach to problem solving. I needed to let go of a lot of the type A control and basically get in touch with my softness and sensitivity. And that process began in 2006 as well. When I went through this live spring training, I'll speak to an exercise that my trainer had me do. He had me come to class dressed as an infant girl. So dressed in peak bonnet and peak jumper, and he had me shave my goatee. And during this process, I got in touch with my feminine side in a way that I've never been able to before. And I spent basically a week just sobbing and in tears, just letting go. It couldn't even articulate it. But that was the beginning of a softening. And I think that this second episode, realizing that in order for me to heal, I've got to soften. I've got to let go of energies. So I could speak a long time on this particular thing, but what I began to realize is that the medicines were allowing me to heal. And I also began very curious into this new psychedelic renaissance in terms of how the psychedelics can facilitate behavior change and the suspension of what's called the default neural network, which is essentially our unconscious patterns, our behaviors. And I began to do a lot of research and listen to a lot of experts in the field. And I began to see the connections in my professional life. My goal is to help people to adopt the wellness habits and behaviors, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, and sleep, these things that build our capacity, build our buoyance, build our vitality. And I recognize that psychedelics can be a, an ally in the service of installing new behaviors that people have been struggling to install. And that's been the primary driver behind my interest and in application of psychedelics. And so I recognize that a lot of my clients, they will sabotage themselves based on undealt with, unprocessed emotions. Whenever people deal with stresses or they get triggered, they will do things that will sabotage themselves. They'll go to alcohol, they'll go to addictions, they'll go to chocolate, they'll go to food, they'll go to avoidance behaviors. And I firmly believe, and the research is showing this, that psychedelics can help us to metabolize those energies and those emotions, those undealt with things that derail us from being consistent with activity, being consistent with meditation, being consistent in eating well. And that's where my interest lies. In, in psychedelics is to dissolving, metabolizing, releasing, and learning from these unprocessed emotions, these unprocessed energies, these undigested things that cause us to act from our lower nature instead of what's in our best interest. So I've done a lot of speaking there. I'll just pause and try to get some feedback. So Josh, that is such an interesting description of why you're connected with this work and why you're helping people as a facilitator, because that is really a lot of overlap with why it is that 
dream work is such a point of fascination for us. It's not only endlessly full of variety, like using a plant medicine and the kinds of unique experiences that people report, but it goes to very deep places within us and helps us to get symbolic messages about uh, unmetabolized issues, things from childhood, things that are essentially emotional material, things related to past traumas and hurts, and to suggest next steps for what we might do to actually heal those things. So it's just really interesting how much overlap there is. It's just, an, I just, it's another, it's another tool in the toolbox, you know, and, and I'm, I'm called to learn to wield this medicine tool in a really masterful way. And you're called to wield this dream interpretation tool in this masterful way. And it's beautiful. That's very kind of you to say, I think we're far from dream interpretation masters, but I guess that's, that's the direction. I'm not a plant medicine master either. <laughs> I'm <just> yeah. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. It's about being a learner on the path and having that North star of really mm -hmm. wanting to achieve mastery someday. Right. right. That. And that also highlights, we should point out our mission at DreamSpeak, as we understand it at this point, is to teach people to interpret their message dreams step by step so that they can get that benefit. It's that desire to really help other people to be able to do this work for themselves that I think has motivated us to be more public about it. And I think that's always more powerful when you can teach someone to do something for themselves. And it's something that we have available to us every single night. Yeah. Potentially. <laughs> and we all go through dry spells. Yeah. But it, there's plenty to work on. Even if you only dream once every few weeks, there's still plenty to find out about yourself just from that. So Josh, I feel like this is a pretty decent point to segue into the dream that you sh shared with me previously. Why don't you do your best to recall what happened in that dream? And we can also talk about the circumstances as well around when you had that dream. Yeah. So um, the dream was, in my best recollection, I was being robbed by a high school friend. And the setting was in Napa, California, where my cousins live. And I was in an unfamiliar home, but I knew that I was in the Napa Valley area because my cousin presented herself um, before I got robbed. So I was with my cousin and I knew that family was around. And then the scene and the focal point of the dream changed. So I was in the same setting that I was with my cousin, but suddenly I was being robbed by a friend of mine. And this friend was a very significant um, influence in my late teens. And he was the source of where I would get my contraband, my weed. He was someone that he spent a lot of time at his house. His parents were relatively wealthy. They lived in a couple million dollar home on the lake. Uh, it was always a fun thing to go over to his house. But he represented, at that time, drugs. He also represented trouble and he had a lot of problems with authority. Also, as time went on, he was homophobic, very openly homophobic, turning out later that he actually was homosexual and he was just in denial of that energy. Mm -hmm. But what had happened in the dream is that it was him, and I can't recall who else it was, but him and some people that he brought in, he was robbing me. He was robbing my home. And I remember that they were focusing on taking weapons, taking guns. And I basically remember asking, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this to me? And I really didn't get an answer. I just felt like because I can, you know? Um, and I remember there was a part of the dream in which there was a piece of pottery that I knew my daughter, is. I knew that she had created it. And it's, he was kind of like taunting me, like he's going to destroy this thing. And I remember him shooting it with a gun and the bullets ricocheting off of it and couldn't harm it. Um, and then I also remember looking out a window and there was some cubby holes on the outside of the house where he was just stealing more stuff. I mean, I just remember, I don't exactly remember what it was, but looking out a window, watching him continue to pillage. And at some point, my older brother came in to the scene and I remember somehow he got a gun and he pointed it at this friend that was robbing me and he turned into a dog, a kind of a harmless little poodle shih tzu kind of animal. A and what's that? A ship here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I a ship here. There you are. So I remember him turning in and I can't understand why I, I was powerless. And for whatever reason, my brother was able to take action against this guy in a way that I was not able to. And I remember it was some point in the dream, my, some family members came to check on me while I was being robbed. And it's like, hey, I need help. I need help. And so my family members were able to go and get help. And I remember after this friend had turned into a dog, I remember three policemen coming to the house, knocking on the door and me answering the door. And they actually the, I invited the police in. And I remember them 
taking seats, like taking your seats in recliners and a lot of Barney Fife kind of bumbling and like not taking this very seriously. Um, I remember thinking to myself, how am I going to convey to them that the person that was robbing me has now turned into a dog and that they need to arrest <laughs> this dog? It's like, this sounds, this, this is right. This sounds ridiculous, right? How am I going to convey this to them? This sounds insane. And as I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm, I can't really come to any resolution in the dream other than, okay, so the police are here. The intruder or the thief has turned into this animal. And I think everything's okay now. I think that's about where I remember the dream concluding. That's great. So just throwing it out there so we don't forget that idea of the robber turning into a dog. It's so absurd. There are symbols in dreams that we call uncanny symbols. And those are symbols that are really meant to make sure that we remember our dreams. And it really call attention and say, hey, this is an important point. Like you're going to want to try to understand this because it's going to help you. And this was definitely an uncanny symbol for you. Sure. Oh, yeah. Like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So we have so many interesting starting points, but what I think might be a cool way to start is that um, one of the key things about unlocking a dream and really getting the meaning of how do I move my life forward using this guidance is to connect it to your waking life. And I think the circumstances immediately preceding when you had this dream are pretty significant in this particular case. So maybe we should talk a little bit about what was going on for you in waking life when this dream came up. Yeah, sure. So let's go back to, there's some further developments in terms of medicine and facilitation and my certification going through all that. And so in my plant medicine journey, I was invited to learn about and participate in a psychedelic therapist training involving MDMA. And uh, my mentor is a gentleman named Jonathan Robinson that has been doing this work since um, the mid eighties. Um, and I actually just came out with a book called Ecstasy is Medicine. And so I took this course and I had done a medicine journey with my wife. And one of the biggest conflicts between me and my wife is me being a stepdad and finding common ground on raising children and not triggering each other, not blaming, shaming, or complaining with each other around the differences in our approaches to parenting and approaches to life. Um, I'm more of a, a hard love or tough love kind of guy, recognizing that it's important for us to let our children face circumstances and difficulties so they can become strong. And my wife is more of a, a tender heart and wanting to shower th her children with love and appreciation and take difficulties away, don't let them suffer, you know? And so this session in MDMA, um, it allowed us to see each other and find each other and connect with each other and really work to make our connection more important than either one of us being right about the way that we saw the approach to parenting or the approach to life. Do you remember what it felt like in the immediate wake of it? Like what were some okay. bits? So after our MDMA session, we had that session recorded as part of the protocols. And our assignment was to listen to that recording before we had an integration session with our guide. And listening to that session, it helped take us into a deeper place of understanding and reflection of all the things we had talked about and what we really want in terms of deep connection and understanding. And it was through those discussions, basically we listened to five minutes of the recording and we talked for 30 minutes in the morning about what that meant and what that felt for us and what it brought up. And it was through these discussions that my wife was able to articulate based on her upbringing, based on her childhood, she didn't really feel protected by her family. She had some issues where she just kind of felt like she was discarded and not really um, not protected. And so when I help her feel protected, when I'm in a way that helps her feel nurtured and cared for and protected, she opens, she feels most accessible to love. And when I become kind of an authoritarian and by the book, by the rules, hey, we need responsibility and discipline here. There needs to be consequences. When I take that position, there's something in her that shuts down. She doesn't feel protected. She feels threatened. It's like, uh, imagine that you get pulled over for a speeding ticket. Nobody feels comfortable as that police officer is walking up to the side of your car. Nobody likes that feeling. Mm. And what I realize is that unconsciously, even though what I'm trying to do as a responsible parent is, hey, there's these rules and regulations that if we'll follow them, 
everyone will get along, everyone will be safe, everyone will be okay if we can just follow these rules. And ultimately, I mean, that's that's the purpose of the police in a society is to, hey, we, we need to follow these rules so that everyone is okay, everyone stays safe, everyone respects each other, yada, yada. But in my delivery of my unconscious way of delivering that message of of expressing myself or communicating, the way that I would do that would put my wife's walls up and she would shut down and I'd lose my connection to her. And it was horrible. I hate losing my connection to my wife. But through our conversations after our MDMA experience, we started to develop a language for being able to understand each other on a such deeper level. I started to be able to see how my communication is not being received by her, even though my intention is for the good of all concerned. It's like, what's good for everybody here? But it wasn't being received and interpreted through her lens, through her understanding that way. And this dream and this discovery um, of what Thomas and I have worked through, and it's kind of a mysterious, I mean, I can't even articulate how this happened, how we got to the point of this catharsis in me identifying that I need to stop being this policeman. I'm kind of jumping ahead, but this is kind of what's clear to me is that when I become the policeman, when I become the authoritarian, when I push the agenda of keeping everybody safe and responsible and following the rules and res- discipline and responsibility and consequences, that way of being shuts down my wife and I lose my connection to her and it's painful and I hate it. And that's something that I'm becoming more and more aware of and have a language to articulate it. So do you remember in relationship to when you had your MDMA session, when this dream happened? It was afterwards, right? It was. Yeah, it was. And I have to go back in days or was it like a couple of weeks or a month? Let me go back to my journal because I've got a journal entry because the MDMA experience was the last week of November. So the dream, it was the first week of December. So it was about a week after the MDMA experience. Perfect. Yeah. This dream happened about a week after you guys had that facilitated MDMA session together. All right. Well, let's interpret it. How's that sound? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. So um, one of the things that we love to do is just take a moment to list all the aspects or the people that were in a dream and all the symbols that we can think of that were in a dream. And then we kind of choose a, a point to begin from there. So what people do you remember being in this dream, Josh? What aspects? So I remember my cousin and she represents just that like in my teens, she was the cousin that I was closest to most. So I remember for some reason in the dream, this, why are you, why are you still not married? That, I think that was the subject of why are you still not married? And there wasn't really any answer to that, but that was the feeling that I, that I had towards her. But the, the you know, in real life, she is married, you know, she's married, she has kids and for whatever reason in my dream, um, I had that question for her. Um, Interesting. So yeah. when people are married in a dream, what that means is that they're making a long-term commitment to create with a certain part of themselves. And so it's really easy um, when somebody is straight because the opposite gender rule just applies directly. So you got one person and then a person of an opposite gender. These two aspects can create together. And so creation essentially in a dream is what moves our lives forward, right? We're always creating something, creating new perceptions, cooking a meal, just very simple things. These are all acts of creation. That's how we live. Right. So when we marry in a dream, it's basically choosing a part of ourself that we feel is really helping us to move forward and to evolve, hopefully, <laughs> if it's a positive marriage for us in the dream. And so one of the things you might be carrying as a question, which we may revisit in this interpretation or we may not, is that part of your subconscious represented by your cousin is not currently committed to a creative relationship. And so I guess you were kind of taking stock of that. It's like, here I have this really potent positive part of myself and my subconscious, but it's not really creating anything in my life. Why is that? So just something to think about. So yeah. what are the four in this dream? So there was the character that brought me. That was a character from my high school years, the one that supplied me with marijuana, with drugs. And I think even I did some LSD at the time. I think he was a source of that from time to time. So he was there. My brother showed up, my older brother and my younger brother showed up kind of in the next chapter. Um, there was the people that represented my extended family that I asked for help for um, when I felt like I couldn't help myself, but they didn't look like anyone that I knew. I just knew that they, they represented my extended family. They represented my cousins in California. Um, that's what I felt. But, um, right. there was the, there was the three police officers the, there were the unknown individuals that were kind of accomplices in the robbery. Those are the characters that, those are the entities that I can come up with. 
That's great. If we do get to the pottery part, I think we'll probably find something interesting and it absolutely ties to a really important part of your subconscious represented by your daughter. Pretty cool. Yeah. So why don't we just rattle off a bunch of symbols? So we'll choose where to start afterwards. We don't need to dwell on them, but what are all the symbolic elements in this dream that we can think of? There's Napa Valley itself. Uh, what other symbols can you think of, Josh? The, the fact that, that he seemed to be stealing weapons. You have to focus on weapons. Yeah, uh, weapons, thievery yeah. or robbery is a, a symbol in this dream. What else? Y yeah, um, I remember distinctly there was an upstairs and downstairs, so the, and I don't know what that means. Yeah, um, that wasn't in the house. Yeah, and the, there was this dog. There were the police Sorry. officers, or were. Oh, I, I, I remember from a previous podcast that I listened to, you mentioned that a window, windows are important, windows are significant. I remember looking out a window and seeing more thievery taking place outside. You described it as kind of a cubby hole. Did that yeah. mean like a little window? I, it's like, so no, it was a, it was a normal size window, but it, outside the window, it felt like there were these little stacked cubby holes on top of each other outside the house. I don't know if it's significant or not, but like outside attached to the house were these little cubby holes with stuff in them and they were pillaging those little cubby holes. They were stealing all the stuff out of the cubby holes? Yeah, right. These guys are such jerks. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, That's a lot. I mean, already, I'm sure we'll, if we yeah. need to deal with any other ones, they'll come up incidentally. So I was thinking we could probably start this interpretation chronologically. They usually don't stay chronological, but we might as well just start talking about Napa since that okay. was the first thing you mentioned. So- one of the things that we teach people is to understand a symbol in a dream, there's a universal meaning which should be taken into account. And it always needs to be paired with your personal associations or your personal meaning. And that's how you get the whole picture of what a symbol means. So an area like Napa has to do with an attitude that you have. So it's not just an opinion. It's kind of like a broader issue than that. It's a way of looking at things when you're using a certain mindset that might influence your opinions on a lot of things all at once. And so one thing that can make it much easier to understand what attitude that might be referring to is to then bring in your personal associations. So can you give us a little bit of the background information on the time that you spent in Napa? You were saying this is when you were younger, right? Yeah, I got to spend two summers in the Santa Rosa, Napa Valley area. That's where my cousins live. And it just represents a beautiful temperate area of the country. I enjoy it, love it, would love to spend more time up there. Um, you know, I think I was um, 13 and 14 is whenever I visited that area. And you know, I haven't spent a whole lot of it. I've never got to do a Napa Wine Valley tour or anything of that nature, but that's just, that's what comes to mind. Nice. Well, that surfaces the issue of nature, doesn't it? And well, yeah. And nature is really important to me. That's I mean, my, my life right now is I'm getting out of nature and camping as often as possible. And, and being in nature is a way that connects me to the divine. I mean, it is really important to me important for me to be up when the sun comes up and have that experience. And um, yeah, so nature is an important part of my life. Beautiful. So we'll talk about that waking life and dream connection. We'll talk about the universal meaning of nature. I think that'll be helpful. So the universal meaning of nature is an interesting one because plants are basically the manifestation of us creating things. It's a great metaphor to think of your conscious mind as something that would plant a seed and your subconscious mind as soil. And the power of the subconscious mind is pretty evident when you think of it as soil, because mm -hmm. that's really where the magic comes from. Right. And the thought or the conscious impulse just creates the plan, the seed. And so then when things grow, what that means is the things that we have done in our lives or karmically or however you want to think of it with intention, maybe sometimes not so consciously, but still with our thoughts, those bring forth life. And so when you think of nature itself, what you basically have there is, it's like, this is my life pattern. It's like nature is my dharma um, and the mix of what I've done with my willpower and what the universe does around me and how we co-create. So that kind of dharmic image is the universal meaning of nature. And I think that that is really interesting because it can help us understand why nature is so recharging and renewing. Because when we get out into a natural environment in waking life, it makes us feel that way. But symbolically, what being in nature in a dream represents is that we're forming more awareness of the results of what it is that we do in our lives, getting a little bit of a chance to take stock. And then also not every single thing that happens in our lives is just a result of us. 
some things are coming towards us from the universe, or you might think of it as we're drawing certain energies towards ourselves because of our plan for this lifetime and who we are. And so in the same way, when you see nature in a dream, it's also oftentimes going to be renewing for you. You know, that opportunity to take stock, relax, and kind of see the ways in which we're supported and which there's so much more to our lives than just the little day-to-day issues that often distract our attention, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if this has to do with, gosh, moving from needing to have so much control and being a type A person. Well, this was a time in your life when you were 13 and 14 and were with your cousins where you could really be in a more relaxed state, right? Yeah, I would say I was much more exposed to nature there than I was in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex growing up. Yeah, definitely. A big big contrast. Yeah. So maybe that's why you chose that location for your dream. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And so uh, the setting at the house in Napa was where the robbery took place or was that back at your house? This house was an unfamiliar house. It was a house I'd never been in before to my knowledge. It wasn't a house that I knew in Napa. It was an unknown home. So that's the important part because what we had just established about Napa probably representing a time in your life where you were not as type A and you didn't have such a strong sensibility that you had to control your environment. That's why the house would be in that geographic location. So that attitude is tied to what you were talking about around your MDMA work and that awareness that releasing control and being softer is to your benefit. And a house actually represents a mindset. So any sort of indoor space represents a mindset. And you said that the house is unfamiliar. And so that simply means that that particular mindset is also unfamiliar. And that's going to be where we start getting the really helpful information from this dream, I think. Because this dream message was trying to help you become familiar with this mindset. And I guess ultimately also see that it wasn't a productive mindset for you. And I get that from the fact that the robbery was taking place. Mm -hmm. Keep going. (laughs) Okay. So essentially we use the symbol of your friend from high school now, this aspect of your friend from high school to help us understand what is problematic about that mindset. And so you've said several times that this person was kind of a low vibration character, but at the same time, you've developed a lot of empathy and compassion for this person as you've grown wiser. You started to understand that there were difficulties in that person's life, that that person had disowned this crucial part of themselves in the form of their sexuality, and that even though they were your drug dealer, that those drugs are not only drugs, that there's also a sensibility of something like LSD as plant medicine or marijuana as plant medicine. And it depends on the context and the intent with which you're using these things, right? Yeah. I'd also like to add that at the time of this dream, I'm being cautious of how close I allow myself to get to them in real life. Do I reconnect with this person? Do I trust them? Do I reestablish a relationship? Those are active questions. Whoa. You just gave me a great insight, Joshua. So let me see if I can't stitch together several of the important themes from this dream just right now. So the unfamiliarity of the mindset, I think, is the questioning attitude that you were just describing. So this house in Napa essentially represents being in that space of asking those important questions for yourself. And those questions were not necessarily completely novel to you, which is why the house was situated in a familiar place, but the house itself was not familiar. Those questions, though, have become more urgent, and also you have greater wisdom to really resolve these questions, perhaps, than you have in the past. And I think we can credit some of that to your work with the plant medicine and the breakthroughs that you were having with your wife at the time. And essentially what we have here is we've got a contrast between your old friend from high school and all of those things. Of course, really doesn't have anything to do with your friend. This is a part of your consciousness right. Right, that has these struggles. And then your sense of, well, how do I re-own and reintegrate this part of myself? And that's where the police come in. And we'll get into that because there's nuance there. They were bumbling police officers. But if we just speak hypothetically, police are super conscious aspects because they're authority figures. And they essentially do what you were describing earlier. On a universal level, these are parts of our world or ourselves or both that help us to obey the laws of the universe. 
that help us to learn how to live in balance with the reality in which we find ourselves. And that obviously will help us a great deal with our spiritual growth because if we're constantly trying to rail against universal law, we're going to find a tremendous amount of unnecessary struggle in our life. And so what you see from the qualities of this old high school friend is this self-disownment. And so there's, there's the wildness, there's the impulsiveness, but in a sense, all of that has to do with a basic lack of self-love or self-understanding. And I, I really want you to kind of color this in and fill this in. But the contrast that I want to show is that is going to lead to tremendous resistance and frustration if this person is just allowed to behave this way. This part of yourself is allowed to just kind of go wild and continue with these struggles that are based on ignorance instead of coming within the Tao or universal law and living in balance with the way that the world actually is. So you know, you've got these parts of yourself that are disowned and you've got your mindfulness practice and all of the wisdom that has told you this part of me needs to come under control. But then as you're working on softening, you're realizing the essence of this whole situation and these questions that I'm trying to understand and answer and resolve is that it's a paradox. I need to soften and stop being the police so that this aspect of my consciousness can finally heal and accept itself and love itself. Yeah, you know, I'll speak to the catharsis that happened last time we spoke. There's something so powerful about this part of me that isn't working. It was magical, the realization and the catharsis that happened when I realized that I've got to stop being the policeman, I've got to stop using the policeman. I mean, it was a complete full body release and catharsis and crying and sobbing and realization. I know that we hit the bullseye on something, but it slips through my fingers when I try to articulate it to myself. It was mysterious to us right after it happened. You know, <laughs> it, it was. It yeah. was wild. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And it was beautiful. And I do think that it's miraculous. I think, first off, we should just point out, and this is the real gift of dream interpretation. It's about helping us find greater alignment within ourselves. Facilitation is really wonderful and we love facilitating, but sometimes those moments that you're describing, and they're really rare and special, but as a dream interpreter, we are able to get ourselves to those moments. And it's like the words and the conceptual approach to the interpretation is almost like the plucking of strings of an instrument. Mm -hmm. when everything just comes together into this beautiful symphony you can have very deep and meaningful realizations about yourself. You know, and that happened and I can't intellectualize it in my head anymore. Yeah. And you don't need to. It's the difference between words and music. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It was mind blowing. And that's a beautiful, amazing thing. And I'm so glad that we were able to do that because that also means that it was a personal breakthrough for you. Absolutely. And that's how I see this whole thing. So the MDMA healing session that you did precipitated the dream so that we could have the interpretation session so that you could have this personal breakthrough. It was all arranged so that you could experience the growth that you needed. Yeah. What I've heard from you, Josh, is essentially that growth is realizing that it's not the policeman within you that's going to create the ever-expanding love that you want. No, it's not. And so the interesting thing is, is that the policeman has all the best intentions, but he's a horrible communicator. He's horrible at communicating his intentions. And so part of me has got to kind of retire that persona and I've got to stop using him to communicate with. And he's been my default communicator is that usually that's who I rely on uh, to do my communication, to speak to what I see as injustice or out of alignment or lack of integrity in a situation when somebody is not being wise, let's say when kids are not being wise or wife is not being wise and someone's doing something that's going to create a negative result in our family that I rely on the policeman mostly. And the policeman doesn't ask questions. He usually just lays down the law and enforces the law. And what I've got to realize is that I've got to learn how to communicate in a different way that doesn't feel intimidating, that doesn't feel like somebody's in trouble whenever I arrive on the scene to help solve an issue, help solve a problem, to lend support, to lend care. And I'm still in that process, learning how to do that better and better and better. Well, as long as I've known you, which is several years, maybe 13 or 14 years now, mm -hmm, yeah, it seems like you have not struggled with 
discipline. You are a very disciplined person. That's just a trait that really stands out. And it serves you well in a lot of ways. But I guess it's not how you need to approach everything. Yeah, especially intimate relationship and parenting. And my nature is, a, you know, I've been a trainer and a coach for nearly two decades. And that persona is useful in those arenas. And, but that persona is not useful in all contexts. And that's what I'm realizing is uh, I've got to expand my dimensionality beyond just this a policeman avatar, this coach avatar, this trainer avatar is like, okay, here's what we need to do. Let's go do it. And that's what I'm paid to do in the, the training arena, you know? Right. Well, I'd love to find out more about um, your high school friend turning into a dog, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I, <thought laughs> I had to be curious. Yeah. So your older brother had a gun and when he pointed it at your friend, then your friend turned into a dog. With some yeah. Place. So my brother knew where there was a gun in a closet for whatever reason. I couldn't do this, but he did. And I believe that he pointed the gun at the thief and turned into a dog. So maybe we should look at what the qualities of your older brother are. Great idea. When we're trying to understand what an aspect represents in a dream, we always try to define a few qualities for them. Sometimes it's even just one, but that's a quality in your own consciousness because he's also male. So what would be some words you'd use to describe your older brother? Um, so I would say that stoic and unaware and distracted is what I would say. I mean, I don't know how to place that into this dream, but he's the one that got the gun. You know? yeah. So that's probably, just, I'm confused. I'm really confused about that. Yeah. But, we're going to see if we can clear that up. Yeah. So we'll take our best stab at it. Your older brother seems like a person that I was kind of expecting would have, um, some kind of power that the dreamer being your presence in the dream that the dreamer didn't have the power to reveal that this robber, your old high school friend, was just a dog. But now I'm thinking it's actually perhaps uh, a little bit different and maybe even the inverse of how I was imagining this would turn out. So a dog or any animal represents habitual behavior, okay? And so what is revealed in his transformation from a person into a dog is that these have become ingrained habits, the kinds of habits that your old friend exhibited. Um, how would you describe those habits of your high school friend? Destructive. That's such a Ant good way of saying it. Anti Antisocial. Yeah. Destructive. Yeah. Antisocial. And uh, self-destructive, wouldn't you agree? Yes. And those things, as far as I understand, and really color this in, like I said, I could be way off here, but those things have a root that I feel like you've shared with us in not loving yourself adequately enough. So well, I would say universally, yes. And universally, when you don't love yourself, yes, you fall victim to destructive, you know, self-destructive behaviors. Absolutely. All kinds of self-destructive behaviors that come out of a lack of self-love. Is it possible for you to see that as connected to yourself? I mean, I'm sure that there's aspects where I could be more self-loving. It's not a theme that I connect to on a very deep level. Personally, I feel that through my practices, my commitment to movement, my commitment to sleep, my commitment to mindfulness, my commitment to self-discovery and spirituality, I believe those are all aspects of ways that I am loving to myself. I don't feel like I am cruel to myself. We could all love ourselves more. I don't feel like I'm flatulating myself. I don't feel like I'm abusive to myself. I really don't. Yeah. And I think it degrees and nuance, like degrees of intensity and nuance are really important in dreams. And that's kind of why I want to dwell on this and have your help getting it more accurate. Because we know from the fact that you have this high school robber present, that you're taking your own energy with some of these behaviors. But we also know that you have got a healthy sense of self-love. Just the fact that this habit this person still exists in your consciousness doesn't mean that you don't have healthy self-love. It means that there's something lingering that's yet to be resolved. And your breakthrough was about having the ability to understand one way, maybe the biggest way in which you're going to be able to resolve that. That was when you realized that you did not need to show up in your life as the policeman. Well, so this is a good time to start talking about another aspect of healing that I've been through. And so on my journey of healing, I had a friend refer me to a Tibetan acupuncturist, a Tibetan healer. And she's a seventh generation Tibetan healer. 
that I began to see. And what she began to help me understand is that when we become charged with anger and frustration, that that actually gets stored in our bodies. And what she helped me understand is that my liver was overcharged with this chi from being overly frustrated with the things that were happening in my household and my inability to get the results that I wanted with my stepson and being really frustrated that I couldn't do what I know I felt like I needed to do to help him be responsible and disciplined and consequences and learn and stop being enabled and all those things. And she helped me understand that what we have to do is we've got to help you soften, 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 soften. So her work with her acupuncture, and what she helped me understand is that your energy is not flowing through your spine. Your energy is not flowing. It's cut off. And because your energy is not flowing, you're not healing. And so what we've got to do is get the energy to disperse throughout your body and stop being stored in this one area. And she would say it's stored, it's over-concentrated in your liver. And so part of what we're doing is learning to dissipate and soften, I mean, soften my organ. Your liver is, is too rigid. Your kidney is too rigid. And she would work to soften, not only soften my attitudes, but literally softening my organs through the disbursement of this energy that was stored and concentrated in my liver. And I can't say I fully understand the process. I'm a novice in this. But what I can tell you is that I'm healed. I can tell you that. And That's this is great. It was a three and a half year journey. And this began in May of 2020. So part of this is that the energy medicine, the acupuncture and the work that she was doing was she was working to help me soften. The medicine was working to help me soften. The meditation was helping me soften. And so Thomas, you ask about, is there an aspect of self-love that I need to tap into more? It's not necessarily an aspect of self-love in my opinion. It's an aspect of learning to be more gentle, to be more allowing, more receptive. And that's what I feel like I need to own. And maybe that is a disowned part of me that I need to bring back into my being. And that's what this journey is about. Mm -hmm. You had said earlier when you were initially describing the dream that your older brother was not powerless, but you were powerless to yeah. make change. Yeah. Yeah. He was able to do something I wasn't able to do. Remember how I said that the house represents the mindset of mm -hmm. these open questions that you're trying to live through and understand? Yeah. I think this is a part of that or emblematic of that because you're not powerless. It's like you're learning how to devise the power as the dreamer to take over that function because with all your hard type A self-discipline and your disciplined meditation, you're able to see with empathy and compassion, what's going on with this high school friend of yourself and why they would be motivated to rob and steal. That's when they turn into a dog. It's not that they actually turned into a dog. It's that you became aware, oh, this is just a habit pattern that I have. Yeah. Right. No, that, that lands. Yeah. And so that's kind of your older brother, that part of yourself, that more type A stoic or harder part of yourself. And you as the dreamer are sitting there witnessing and you're thinking, well, how did he do that? But you're going to find your way to being able to do that with softness instead of with hardness. Yeah. And it could be that whenever we talked before, it could be that was the thread that you were pulling on that had the awareness. Yeah, I got to stop being the policeman. But it was, it, God, it was powerful and that happened. I really believe that that was a spiritual breakthrough for you, a permanent breakthrough. I do too. Okay, nice, nice. I do too. Yeah, it's cool because when I've had those special experiences of growing a level within myself, like the Grinch, this is so stupid, but the image that came to mind right away was just that image of the Grinch's heart being like, whoop, you, yep. you know, yep. his heart grew three sizes that day yep. or whatever it was. But when I've had that kind of experience, you can't capture it in words. Oh, if you were a painter, maybe you could sit down at your easel and capture an image that might give people a, a whisper of it, but it's too real. It goes too deep within our whole system. It's personal. It's totally subjective and precious. You know, it, that, that's how I feel about psychedelic experiences and breakthroughs too, is that there's a connection. You see something, you feel something that has the potential for permanently changing your perspective. Yeah. And so I think you were all teed up and ready for that when you brought this dream. And I'm so glad that we were able to be a part of that process, but you had done all the hard work. We just helped you unlock it and then just let that loose. So let that new love for yourself and new love for your own intimates free. I accept. That's great. 
Oh, it's interesting what you were saying about the pottery. I feel like if there's one image we should really try to see if we can figure out, that would be a really neat one because it has to do with the fact that your daughter is a part of your subconscious, but a really important and loved part. Right? My intuition is saying that your daughter may represent a counterpoint to your high school friend because instead of being somewhat disowned and something that you've struggled with as a part of yourself, it's something just fully embraced in love and it's, oh, no, it's a part of yourself that you love and accept. And you said that it, the pottery could not be harmed. Yeah, the bullet ricocheted off of it. Mm -hmm. And guns, if we haven't covered this in this particular podcast, we've talked about it a number of times across our podcasts and videos. Weapons are tools for change in the universal sense. So what that means is we can use our willpower to make changes in our life. And when we have a weapon in a dream, it's basically saying my willpower is ready to make a change. I have the ability to make a change right now if I want to, if I choose to. And that, that particular aspect was the the one that was wielding the gun and it shot the pottery was the old friend from high school, right? Yep. Right. And so that aspect was powerless to harm this artifact, which was something that came from this really owned and loved part of yourself, a fully accepted and integrated part of yourself. Okay. So why don't we talk a little bit about why it was pottery? Why do you think that was? Um, I really don't know. And I believe it was like a pottery cup, like a gift. I don't really have anything that really represents that in real life, but I don't it's know. probably just because it was something that she had made. Yeah. It was a gift from her. Yeah. Was it something she had made? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was a gift I'm, from her. That's absolutely it. There's no question. And over her childhood, you guys did those sort of crafts together a number of times, didn't you? Uh huh. Yeah. So that's really what it is. So that incredible quality time between a father and daughter and that act of making something, it's not actually a pot, right? It's not a thing like that in a dream. What it represents is the love itself. Those moments of time that you shared together, those precious memories that you have of creating together, it's the actual creation of love in your relationship is what that pottery would represent. Okay. I can get that. Okay. And so why do you think it was invincible to the the blows of this part of yourself that had these struggles, the high school friend? Well, if, if you're talking about it, it represents the depths of love and connection. To me, the robber thief from high school represented, I guess, lower natures, threatening natures, selfish natures. I don't know. But it, his desire to try and harm something that was forged out of love, to me, just speaks to the the power of love and attention and connection. So that's the way I see it. I think that's probably exactly what it means as well, because it was possible for this person to take a lot of things from the house and even rob the little cubbies. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this person was able to take a lot, but they weren't able to harm that love. Correct. And so it, robbery or thievery is essentially having your energy taken from you. And though, you know, this obviously can drain you, but that part of yourself that comes from that softening can't be taken from there's no way to subtract from it it's just invincible oh because it's his true nature that's who he really is yeah wonderful well i feel like we are pretty much at the end of our um interpretation of this dream how are you feeling about it i'm complete you know I, yeah in my waking world i mean so i've got to make a conscious effort to not be so reliant on the policeman mm -hmm. That really resonates with me, actually, Josh, and we really appreciate that you have been with us today. Um, we just want to remind our listeners that you are a plant medicine facilitator and a personal trainer, and you do take clients remotely, correct? Yeah. So basically, my coaching model sometimes involves medicine experience, sometimes it doesn't. It just depends on what the client um, is looking for. But basically, I provide structure, support, and accountability for integrating movement and nutrition and good recovery practices and meditation practices and mindfulness practices. And I basically help to install those habits so that they can elevate people's life experience. And if it feels right for the individual, then that can involve a medicine session. Now, what's interesting in the way I've been trained for these MDMA sessions, it's actually virtual. So we're doing virtual MDMA session where I can facilitate anywhere in the world. So if that's something that's interesting to people, then feel free to have them reach out. Wonderful. And how should they reach out to you, Josh? Yeah, they can find me on Facebook or they can just send me an email at jhodnet at sbcglobal.net. Fourpillars.health is my uh, coaching website. And that's F-O-U-R? Correct. Yep. 
F O U R P I L L A R S dot health. Correct. Well, wonderful. So it has been a pleasure talking to you about this really pivotal dream, and we hope that it continues to bear great fruit for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And it's great to be connected to you in the space. Thank you for who you both have been throughout my life for the last decade and beyond. Mm. You too. Yeah. And it continues to be a wonderful connection. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. You can find this podcast on all popular streaming services. Email us a dream today at contact at dreamspeak.us. Check out our YouTube channel for a free introductory dream course. Connect with Dreamspeak for even more learning. Our socials are in the description. Our theme music was composed by me, Ricka. This podcast does not constitute medical advice. If you have concerns about your well-being, talk to your doctor or a mental health professional.